Part six of Far Above Rubies by George MacDonald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oh, you naughty, naughty dear! cried Annie as she threw herself into his arms, rejoicing. But at sight of his worn and pallid face, the smile faded from hers, and she thought, What can have befallen him? His lip quivered, and seeking with a watery smile to reassure her, he gave way and burst into tears. Unmanly of him, no doubt, but what is a man to do when he cannot help it? And where is a man to weep, if not on his wife's bosom? Call this behavior un-English, if you will, for indeed Hector was in many ways other than English, and, I protest, English ways are not all human. But I will not allow that it manifested any weakness, or necessarily involved shame to him, the best of men and the strongest, yea the one man whose soul harboured not an atom of self-pity upon one occasion wept i think because he could not persuade the women whom he loved and would fain console to take comfort in his father annie for one reverent moment turned her head aside then threw her arms about him and hid her glowing face on his bosom there's only me in the house dear she said and led the way to their room when they reached it, she closed the door and turned to him. "'So they won't take your story,' she said, assuming the fact, with a sad, sunny smile. "'They refused it absolutely.' "'Well, never mind. I shall go out charring tomorrow. You have no notion how strong I am. It is well for you I have never wanted to beat you. Seriously, I believe I am much stronger than you have the least notion of. There!' feel that arm. I should let you feel it another way, only I'm afraid of hurting you. She had turned up the sleeve of her dress and uncovered a grandly developed arm, white as milk and blossoming in a large, splendidly formed hand. Then playfully, but oh, so tenderly, with the under and softest part of her arm, she fondled his face, rubbing it over first one, then the other cheek, and ended with both arms round his neck, her hands folding his head to her bosom, "'Wife! Wife!' faltered Hector, with difficulty controlling himself. "'My strong, beautiful wife! To think of your marrying me for this!' "'Hector!' answered Annie, drawing herself back with dignity. "'Do you dare to pity me? That would be to insult me, as if I was not fit to be your wife when doing everything for my mother. There are thousands of Scotch girls that would only be proud to take my place, poor as you are.' and you couldn't be much poorer, and serve you without being your wife, as I have the honour and pride to be. But, my blessed man, I do believe you have eaten nothing to-day, and here am I fancying myself your wife and letting you stand there empty, instead of bestirring myself to get you some supper. What a shame! Why, you are actually dying with hunger!" she cried, searching his face with pitiful eyes. On the contrary, I am not in the least hungry, protested Hector. "'Then you must be hungry at once, sir. "'I will go and bring you something the very sight of which will make you hungry.' "'But you have no money, Annie, and not being able to pay we must go without. "'Come, we will go to bed.' "'Yes, I am ready. I had a good breakfast, but you have had nothing all day. "'And for money, do you know Miss Hamper, the dressmaker, actually offered to lend me a shilling, and I took it. "'Here it is. You see—' I was so sure you would bring money home that I thought we might run that much further into debt. So I bought you two fresh eggs and such a lovely little white loaf. Besides, I have just thought of something else we could get a little money for. That dainty chemise my mother made for me with her own hands when we were going to be married. I will take it to the pawnbroker tomorrow. I was never in a pawn shop, Annie. I don't think I should know how to set about it. "'You!' cried Annie, with a touch of scorn. "'Do you think I would trust a man with it? "'No, that's woman's work. "'Why, you would let the fellow offer you half it was worth, "'and you would take it, too. "'I shall show it to Mrs. Whitmore. "'She will know what I ought to get for it. "'She's had to do the thing herself too often, poor thing. "'It would be tearing my heart out. "'What, to part with my pretty chemise? "'Hector, dear, you must not be foolish.' What does it matter so long as we are not cheating anybody? The pawn-shop is a most honourable and useful institution. No one is the worse for it, 
and many a one the better. Even the tradespeople will be a trifle the better. I shall be quite proud to know that I have a pawn-ticket in my pocket to fall back upon. Oh, there's that old silk dress your mother sent me. I do believe that would bring more. It is in good condition, and looks quite respectable. If Eve had got into a scrape like ours, she would have been helpless, poor thing, not having anything to put away. That is the right word, I believe. There is really nothing disgraceful about it. Come now, dear, and eat your eggs. I am afraid you must do without butter. I always preferred a piece of dry bread with an egg. You get the true taste of the egg so much better. One day or another we must part with everything. It is sure to come. Sooner or later, what does that matter? The readiness is all, as Hamlet says. Death or the pawn-shop signifies nothing. Since no man hath aught of what he leaves, what is it to leave betimes? We do but forestall the grave for one brief hour with the pawn-shop. You deserve to have married Epictetus, Annie, you brave woman, instead of Xanthippe. I prefer you, Hector. But what might you have said if he had asked you, and you had heard me be moaning the pawn-shop? Ah, then, indeed! But in the meantime we will go to bed and wait there for to-morrow. Is it not a lovely thing to know that God is thinking about you? He will bring us to our desired haven, Hector, dearest. So, in their sadness, they laid them down. Annie opened her arms and took Hector to her bosom. There he sighed himself to sleep, and God put his arms about them both and kept them asleep until the morning. And in this love, more than in bed, I rest. Annie was the first to spring up and begin to dress herself, pondering in her mind as she did so whether to go first to the pawnbroker's or to the baker, to ask him to recommend her as a charwoman. She would tell him just the truth, that she must in future work for her daily bread. Then Hector rose and dressed himself. "'Oh, Annie,' he said as he did so, "'is it gone, that awful misery of last night in the omnibus? It seemed, as I jolted along, as if God had forgotten one of the creatures he had made.' and that one was me. Or worse, that he thought of me and would not move to help me. And why do I feel now as if he had help for me somewhere near waiting for me? I think I will go and see a man who lives somewhere close by, and find out if he is the same I used to know at St. Andrew's. If he be the same, he may know of something I could try for. Do, replied Annie, I will go with you, and on the way call at the grocer's. I think he will be the best to ask if he knows of any family that wants a charwoman or could give me any sort of work. There's more than one kind of thing I could turn my hand to, needlework, for instance. I could make a child's frock as well, I believe, as a second-rate dressmaker. Can you tell me who was the first tailor, Hector? It was God himself. He made coats of skins for Adam and his wife. Quite right, dear. You may as well try your hand. "'and I know you have done many a time already. "'And if I can get hold of ever so young a pupil, "'I shall be glad even to teach him his letters. "'We must try anything and everything. "'We are long past being fastidious, I hope.' "'He turned and went on with his toilet. "'Oh, Hector!' said Annie suddenly, "'and walked to the mantelpiece. "'I am so sorry. "'Here is a letter that came for you yesterday. "'I did not care to open it, "'though you have often told me to open any letters I pleased.' "'The fact is I forgot all about it, I believe, "'because I was so unhappy at your going away without breakfast. "'Or perhaps it was that I was frightened at its black border. "'I really can't tell now why I did not open it.' "'With little interest and less hope, "'Hector took the letter, black-bordered and black-sealed, "'opened it and glanced carelessly at the signature, "'while Annie stood looking at him in the hope merely "'that he would find in it no fresh trouble, "'some forgotten bill, perhaps.' She saw his face change, and his eyes grow fixed. A moment more, and the letter dropped in the fender. He stood an instant, then fell on his knees and threw up his hands. "'What is it, darling?' she cried, beginning to tremble. "'Only five hundred pounds,' he answered, and burst into an hysterical laugh. "'Impossible!' cried Annie. "'Who can have played us such a cruel trick?' said Hector feebly. "'It's no trick, Hector,' exclaimed Annie. "'There's nobody would have the heart to do it. "'Let me see the letter.' 
She almost caught it from his hands as he picked it from the fender and looked at the signature. "'Hail and hail,' she read. "'I never heard of them.' "'No, nor anyone else, I dare say,' answered Hector. "'Let us see the address at the top,' said Annie. "'There it is. Philpot Lane. Where is that? I don't believe there is such a place. Oh, yes, there is. I've seen it. Somewhere in the city, I believe. But let us read the letter. I saw only the figures. I confess I was foolish enough at first to fancy somebody had sent us five hundred pounds. And why not? cried Annie. I'm sure there's no one more in want of it. And that's just why not, answered Hector. Did you ever know a rich man leave his money to a poor relation? Oh, I hope it does not mean that my father is gone. He may have left us a trifle, only he could not have had so much to leave anybody. I know he loved you, Annie. In the meantime, Annie had been doing the one sensible thing, reading the letter, and now she stood pondering it. I have it, Hector. He always uses good people to do his kindnesses. Don't you remember me telling you about the little old lady in Graham's shop the time your book came out? "'Yes, Annie, I wasn't likely to forget that. "'It was my love for you that made me able to write the poem. "'Ah, but how soon was the twenty pounds I got for it spent, "'though I thought it riches then!' "'So it was, and so it is!' cried Annie, half laughing, but crying outright. "'It's just that same little old lady. "'She was so delighted with the book, and with you for writing it, "'that she put you down at once in her will for five hundred pounds.' believing it would help people to trust in God. And here I was, distrusting so much that I was nearly ready to kill myself. Only I thought it would be such a terrible shock to you, my precious. It would have been to tell God to his face that I knew he would not help me. I am sure now that he is never forgetting, though he seems to have forgotten. There was that letter lying in the dark through all the hours of the long night, while we slept in the weariness of sorrow and fear, not knowing what the light was bringing us. God is good! Let us go and see these people and make sure, said Annie. Hale and hearty, do they call themselves? But I am going with you myself this time. I am not going to have such another day as I had yesterday, waiting for you till the sun was down and all was dark, you bad man, and fancying all manner of terrible things. I wonder... I wonder if... Well, what do you wonder, Annie? Only whether, if now we were to find out it was indeed all a mistake, I should yet be able to hope on through all the rest. I doubt it. I doubt it. Oh, Hector, you have taught me everything. More, it seems, than I have myself learned. Your mother had already taught you far more than I ever had to give you. "'But it is much too early yet, I fear, to call in the city,' said Annie. "'Don't you think we should have time first to find out "'whether the gentleman we were thinking of inquiring after today "'be your old college friend or not? "'And I will call at the grocer's "'and tell him we hope to settle his bill in a few days. "'Then you can come to me, and I will go to you, "'and we shall meet somewhere between.' "'They did as Annie proposed, and before they met, Hector had found his friend, and been heartily received both by him and by his young wife. When at length they reached Philpot Lane, and were seated in an outer room waiting for admission, Annie said, "'Surely, if rich people knew how some they do not know need their help, they would be a little more eager to feather their wings ere they fly aloft by making friends with the mammon of unrighteousness. Don't you think it may be sometimes that they are afraid of doing harm with their money?' I'm afraid it is more that they never think what our Lord meant when he said the words. But, oh, Annie, is it a bad sign of me that the very possibility of this money could make me so happy? They were admitted at length, and kindly received by a grey-haired old man, who warned them not to fancy so much money would last them very long. Indeed, sir, answered Annie, the best thing we expect from it is that it will put my husband in good heart to begin another book. "'Oh, your husband writes books, does he? "'Then I begin to understand my late client's will. "'It is just like her,' said the old gentleman. "'Had you known her long?' "'I never once saw her,' said Hector. "'But I did,' said Annie, "'and I heard her say how delighted she was with his first book. "'Please, sir,' she added, "'will it be long before you can let us have the money?' "'You shall have it by and by,' answered the lawyer. 
all in good time. And now first they learned that not a penny of the money would they receive before the end of a twelve-month. Well, that will give us plenty of time to die first, thought Hector, which I am sure the kind lady did not intend when she left us the money. Another thing they learned was that, even then they would not receive the whole of the money left them, for seeing they could claim no relation to the legator, ten per cent must be deducted from their legacy. If they came to him in a year from the date of her death, he told them he would have much pleasure in handing them the sum of four hundred and fifty pounds. So they left the office, not very exultant, for they were both rather hungry, and had to go at once in search of work, with but a poor chance of borrowing upon it. Nevertheless, Hector broke the silence by saying, "'I declare, Annie, I feel so light and free already that I could invent anything, even a fairy tale, and I feel as if it would be a lovely one. I hope you have a penny left to buy a new bottle of ink. The ink at home is so thick it takes three strokes to one mark. Yes, dear, I have a penny. I have two, indeed, just two pence left. We shall buy a bottle of ink with one, and shall it be a bun with the other?' I think one penny bun will divide better than two half-penny ones. Very well. Only mind I'm to divide it. But do you know, I've been thinking, said Hector, whether we might not take a holiday on the strength of our expectations, for we shall have so long to wait for the money that I think we may truly say we have great expectations. I think we should do better, answered Annie, to go back to your old friend, Mr. Gillespie, and tell him our good fortune— and see whether he can suggest anything for us to do in the meantime. Hector agreed, and together they sought the terrace where Mr. and Mrs. Gillespie lived, who were much interested in their story, and then first they learned that the lady was at least well off enough to be able to help them, and when they left she would have Annie take with her a dozen of her handkerchiefs to embroider with her initials and crest, but Annie begged to be allowed to take only one, that Mrs. Gillespie might first see how she liked her work, "'For then, you see,' she said to her husband, as they went home, "'I shall be able to take it back to her this very evening, "'and ask her for the half-crown she offered me for doing it, "'which I should not have had the face to do "'with eleven more of them still in my possession. "'I have no doubt of her being satisfied with my work, "'and in a week I shall have finished the half of them, "'and we shall be getting on swimmingly.' "'Throughout the winter Hector wrote steadily every night,' and every night Annie sat by his side and embroidered, though her embroidery was not all for other people. Many a time in after years did their thoughts go back to that period, as the type of happy life they were having together. The next time Hector went to see Mr. Gillespie, that gentleman suggested that he should give a course of lectures to ladies upon English poetry, beginning with the Anglo-Saxon poets, of whom Gillespie said he knew nothing, but would be glad to learn a great deal. He knew also, he said, some ladies in the neighborhood, willing to pay a guinea each for a course of, say, half a dozen such lectures. They would not cost Hector much time to prepare, and would at once bring in a little money. Coleridge himself, he suggested, had done that kind of thing. Yes, said Hector, but he was Coleridge. I have nothing to say worth saying. Leave your hearers to judge of that, returned Gillespie. Do your best and take your chance. I promise you two pupils at least not overcritical my wife and myself. It is amazing how little those even who imagine they love it know about English poetry. But where should I find a room? Hector still objected. Would not this drawing-room do? asked his friend. Splendidly, said Hector. But what would Mrs. Gillespie say to it? She and I are generally of one mind, about people at least. Then I will go home at once and set about finding what to say. And I will go out at once and begin hunting you up an audience." Gillespie succeeded even better than he had anticipated, and there was at the first lecture a very fair gathering indeed. When it was over, the one that knew most of the subject was the young lecturer's wife. The first course was followed by two more, the third at the request of almost all of his hearers, and the result was that, before the legacy fell due, Annie had paid all their debts and had not contracted a single new one. But when the happy day dawned, Annie was not able to go with her husband to receive the money. Neither did Hector wish that she had been able, for he was glad to go alone. By her side lay a lovely woman-child peacefully asleep. Hector declared her the very image of the child the rainbow left behind as it vanished. 
One day, when the mother was a little stronger, she called Hector to her bedside, and playfully claimed the right to be the child's godmother, and to give it her name. "'Who else could have so good a right?' answered Hector. Yet he wondered just a little that Annie should want the child named after herself, and not after her mother. But when the time for the child's baptism came, Annie, who would hold the little one herself, whispered in the ear of the clergyman, "'The child's name is Iris.' I have told my little story, but perhaps my readers will have patience with me while I add just one little inch to the tale of the mouse my mountain has borne. Hector's next book, although never so popular as in any outward sense to be called a success, yet was not quite a failure even in regard to the money it brought him, and even at the present day has not ceased to bring in something. Doubtless it has faults, not a few, but happily the man who knows them best is he who wrote it, and he has never had to repent that he did write it. And now he has an audience on which he can depend to welcome whatever he writes. That he has enemies as well goes without saying, but they are rather scorners than revilers, and they have not yet caused him to retaliate once by criticizing any work of theirs. Neither, I believe, has he ever failed to recognize what of genuine and good work most of them have produced— one of the best results to himself of his constant endeavor to avoid jealousy is that he is still able to write verse, and continues to take more pleasure in it than in telling his tales, and still his own test of the success of any of his books is the degree to which he enjoyed it himself while writing it. His legacy has long been spent, and he has often been in straits since, but he has always gathered good from those straits and has never again felt as if slow walls were closing in upon him to crush him, and he has hopes by God's help, and with Annie's, of getting through at last, without ever having dishonoured his high calling. The last time I saw him he introduced his wife to me, having just been telling me his and her story, with the rather enigmatical words, "'This is my wife. You cannot see her very well, for like Hamlet I wear her in my heart's core.' I in my heart of hearts. End of part six. Recording by Hannah Mary. End of Far Above Rubies by George MacDonald.